All right. So, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you on uh, this webinar about uh, the RICS Sustainability Report 2023. I'm Frank Hovoka. I'm a member of the uh, board of RICS and in charge of uh, sustainability uh, uh, inside the board. Um, well, uh, so hello to everyone. We are go now going to start and uh, we will discuss with several, uh, with four panelists about this uh, webinar. So um, we have four panelists and I will introduce them shortly and they will say uh, hello to you. We have uh, Louisa Bowles. Uh, Louisa is partner and sustainability lead at Hawking Brown. Louisa. Hello, everyone. Um, Hello, thank Louisa. you very much for inviting me. You're welcome. Thank you to have you here. Uh, we have uh, Abdulatif uh, Albitawi, director of Emirates Green Building Council. Hello, Abdulatif. Hello, Frank. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with uh, with everyone uh, today at this uh, session. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And it's uh, a pleasure to have you with us uh, on this webinar. Then we have also uh, Simon Sturgis. Simon is uh, the founder of Targeting Zero. So, Simon, hello. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Thank you, Simon, to be with us also. And uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, Kisha Zera. And Kisha uh, is a Global Sustainability Lead at RICS. And uh, uh, hello, Kisha. Nice to hi, see you. Frank. Uh, hi, Frank. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. So very good. So uh, I think we can directly uh, deep into, uh, into the, the topic uh, today, uh, because Kisha, you, you, you had in charge to manage the uh, sustainability report 2023. And uh, uh, I would like you to give us a presentation about the main outcome and, uh, and, and the sustainability report uh, results that was just released, I think, a week ago, if I'm not wrong. Yes, so the RSCS sustainability report, it was released uh, last week during COP28. Um, the results uh, of this report uh, are from two global sentiment surveys, the RSCS Global Commercial Property Monitor and the Global Construction Monitor. In the second quarter of 2023, we used both of these surveys to draw on the expert opinions of built environment professionals on key sustainability issues related to the built environment. Um, and I will be discussing some of the results with you today. Uh, moving on to the, to the next slide, uh, the RSCS Sustainable Building Index is a trackable year-in-year -year measure of appetite for green and climate adapted real estate. Uh, we calculate this index using uh, feedback from our survey. So we take the number of professionals stating that the demand for green buildings has risen and we minus the number who are saying that it, that it has in fact fallen. Um, the positive net balance that we received this year shows that on balance, contributors believe that demand for green buildings has risen over the past 12 months. Um, this, the results are very much similar, similar to 2022 and in 2021 shows that there's been a consistent increase in demand for green buildings. Um, this is not a, a huge surprise. Um, the uh, focus around uh, green real estate and sustainable buildings has increased over the past few years. Um, governments are targeting green buildings and focusing on green building stock uh, to achieve net zero and climate commitments. And the results that we've received are pretty much consistent with other research studies. Uh, for example, Knight Frank, um, they looked at the demand for uh, sustainable uh, London offices over the course of five years, and their research study also showed that the demand, in fact, had risen. Um, to dive in deeper into exactly what uh, uh, 
impacts or what features of sustainable buildings that occupiers and investors are interested in. Um, this is detailed in the next slide. Um, we asked our professionals uh, what are the most important features uh, for occupiers and investors are um, when it comes to green real estate. Energy efficiency, uh, reducing energy consumption and fossil fuel use was pretty much at the top of the list. It had the, the higher share of contributors stating that, uh, that is, it, it, this is an essential aspect for both occupiers and investors when it comes to green buildings. Um, green building certifications was next on the list, particularly for investors. A huge number of uh, professionals um, across the globe said that this was an essential aspect of a green building. Um, there is a, a very key point that's been detailed by Tina Paye, our RSES president in the report, which actually sh suggests that perhaps the focus for occupiers and investors is, is to get that certification, the label, but but not perhaps not many people are interested in sort of real real change or actually requiring a sustainable building and perhaps are more interested in just getting a certification. Uh, it is also interesting to see that reducing embodied carbon is much lower down the list. Um, it comes in well below energy efficiency, um, green building certifications and indoor uh, environmental quality. Um, moving on to the next slide. Uh, we've uh, the RSCS sustainability report has focused on the measurement assessment of carbon across construction projects because uh, the built environment is responsible for a huge amount of global carbon emissions, 40% of global carbon emissions. So we really concentrated, concentrated on this question of whether professionals, construction professionals are measuring carbon across their construction projects. A majority and most say that they, they do not. And this is very much similar to the results that we received in 2022 and in 2021, suggesting that there's been very little progress in this area across the industry. Uh, even if uh, professionals are measuring carbon, uh, there is very little evidence to suggest that this is meaningfully impacting their choice of materials and components. Um, around 16% of respondents only said that said that they do both measure carbon and this does significantly affect the choice of material systems and components um, th that they go within their construction projects. And again, very much similar to the last couple of years, suggesting very little progress in this area. Um, and this is where global standards come in when it comes to enhancing construction um, uh, carbon measurement in construction projects global standards can help the whole life carbon assessment for the built environment that's been developed second edition this year um, it's it's a framework for that help, can help professionals to measure um, uh, carbon across their construction projects across the whole life cycle and it applies to both existing and new uh, new projects and new assets. Um, at the same time, ICMS3 is another global framework that can help professionals um, report on their carbon emissions alongside, their, uh, uh, alongside construction costs. So it's imperative that professionals across the industry adopt these standards and get into the habit of measuring and assessing carbon consistently across their projects across the whole, whole life cycle and perhaps then they would be in a they would be in a better position to address their carbon footprint i will stop there thank you thank you very much for this presentation uh, i think it was uh, Again, uh, 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 some high, highlights, and uh, I really encourage uh, all our uh, auditors to read the report because, again, it's a, it's very rich. There is a lot of other information that can be useful in the different regions where where you are and uh, where you can look at the the, the, the barriers and also. Uh, uh, the different possibilities that uh, open the result of this survey. So thank you again, Kisha, for this presentation and thank you for the great work you have conducted with this uh, sustainability report. So I will go for some questions about this report to, uh, to our uh, uh, panelists because we have some questions and uh, I would like to ask also uh, our auditors to 
ask us and ask the panelists questions uh, in uh, uh, the chat box because then I can uh, relay and ask the question directly uh, live from the chat box. So please uh, type, write down your, your questions in the chat box and uh, I'll do my best to, uh, to, to pass it back, to pass it through our uh, panelists. But well, I have a first question, Simon, because the, the past year uh, we see that there is encouraging uh, signs uh, to for different for companies and uh, different stakeholders to take sustainability uh, seriously uh, how do you see uh, the companies uh, uh, adapting this in their uh, in their day-to-day -day business or do do they really try now to put it on the top of the agenda of their uh, governance or their activities and 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 and, and uh, how they work on uh, implementing uh, key performance indicators. Simon. Uh, thank you, Frank. Um, I probably just to introduce myself. Um, uh, I was lead yes, author. Of Sorry, I forgot to. <laughs> I, I, I was lead author on the, I, I'm an architect by training, but I was lead author on the RICS's um, new uh, uh, Polite Carbon second edition that uh, Keisha mentioned. Um, uh, and I, I also a special advisor to the UK Parliament on um, uh, Paul F. Carbon, uh, one of the inquiries that they've been dealing with, uh, and I also advise many companies and consultants on how to achieve net zero. So that's kind of where where I am. So to answer your question, though, Frank, um, I think it 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 it, it varies. Uh, uh, my answer is going to be sort of slightly UK focused, but um, I will try and make it as broad as possible. Um, so if you to be where you look, so developers, occupiers, companies and consultants and planners and people like that all have a slightly different sort of response level, I suppose. Uh, I think for developers, um, we're seeing in the UK through some of the bigger um, kind of developers who are particularly focused on international type occupiers, I think we're seeing much more take up. And this has been happening gradually over the last six or seven years, but it's really starting to pick up in, in, in sort of speed and, and effect. So you have people like uh, Landsec, British Land, uh, Grosvenor and so on, who are, now really engaged very fully in the whole idea of undertaking whole life carbon assessments and building sustainability generally into what they do. And, and this is not only on new construction, but across their entire portfolio. So they're really looking at how, and of course, the reason they're doing that is they're responding to occupiers. And I think what's interesting about occupiers, I think is that um, what many occupiers that I've come across are starting to re realize is that their demographic, which is, the people they employ are, who are sort of quite often in their maybe even their 20s but certainly in their 30s and 40s are much more aware of ESG related issues uh, and sustainability in, in general and so they don't necessarily want to occupy buildings which are the kind of standard norm if you like whatever that may be so they are starting to question the buildings they go into uh, and that's leading to certain um, emphases which I'll come on to in a second I think also um, uh, the other thing is, 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 of course, consultants and the people who deliver buildings in the built environment. And I think the awareness amongst um, uh, surveyors, architects, con contractors and the supply chain is growing very rapidly. And I think people are now realizing more and more that actually you have to be able to offer services that can deliver um, uh, if you like green buildings or, or sustainable construction and so on. And I think so that's also picking up. And I think that uh, more and more I'm getting, you know, for example, people like say Turner and Townsend, which is a global project management and cost consultancy are now moving to a position where they're saying uh, we will offer whole life carbon assessment as a matter of course. It's not going to be a sort of an option. They're just going to do that. And I think that really tells you that uh, Globally, and they're, they're, as I say, a global company in the US, uh, Far East, uh, Middle East, and the UK. So they are aware that this whole area is shifting, and they won't be doing that, of course, without the, the fact of demand. So this, this points to that. I think also planners, certainly in the UK, um, local authorities are increasingly aware of this issue and are making demands uh, 
of people who wish to develop in their jurisdictions. So, for example, in London, the Greater London Authority uh, has, uh, as part of their uh, policies now, a whole life carbon policy, uh, policy SI2, which I've, I've co authored. Um, but that policy specifically asks for whole life carbon assessment and now for schemes of a certain size, whether that's height or volume or whatever, um, sort of past a certain point, they have to submit to the Greater London Authority. And that's um, starting to collect, uh, produce a large amounts of data which can be collected and, and, and used. So I think there is a shift and I think it is starting to happen. And I think what's also happening, interesting enough, and certainly this is true of a country, a, a country like the UK, and I'm guessing, and I'm, and I'm aware of also in places like France and, and in other words, some of the older cities where there already exist many existing buildings, that um, the emphasis is now shifting increasingly to retrofit and how you can reuse those buildings um, over and above just automatically demolishing and building new. And certainly in the UK, we've had this uh, it's starting to happen uh, with, with increasing numbers of schemes up and down the country um, looking to do the low carbon retrofit approach. And this uh, for occupiers can have benefits. So I know of at least two or three schemes uh, that, that uh, that I'm sort of uh, peripherally involved with, which are uh, doing this because they're, they're, they, they're reusing buildings for, for, for several reasons. One is the ESG factor. In other words, it produces a building which has a lower embodied carbon. And the assumption being, of course, you can bring it up to modern contemporary standards and performance. But also it starts to solve things like working from home issue where post COVID. So, um, rather than having people working from home, you want to get them into the offices, or many companies do, in which case you've got to provide something that's interesting and exciting. And I think, again, this is leading to um, people uh, and occupiers wanting uh, to have more interesting spaces to, to occupy and use. Um, so I think all of these things are, are going to combine. And I think there is a shift. Uh, and I think it is um, also, I think the other thing, of course, is the accessibility of information. I think uh, Keisha mentioned earlier that um, the RICS professional statement version two, professional standards, sorry, version two, um, now is a much more comprehensive document than the original one that we did, which was in 2017. And this document really helps you understand how to assess uh, uh, embodied or, uh, and whole life carbon um, right across uh, both buildings, infrastructure, that's local infrastructure, but also uh, major infrastructure like uh, uh, railways and airports and what have you. So all of those things can now be assessed and, and, and analysed. Um, and uh, so I noticed in, in, in one of the graphs that uh, Keisha showed, it said that about sort of I think less than 25 percent said they would do carbon analysis if there was a proper method to do it. Well, there is. So there's no more excuses, I'm afraid. Um, you've, you, you can do it and the, the, the assessment um, uh, methodology will of course be uh, come through into software packages, software tools of many, uh, and I think uh, you know for people who are doing assessments you'll know that the important thing is to make sure and ask your software tool provider do they comply with the RICS professional standard 2023 important question because if they don't do that then you can't be certain that they are matter, you know, at a certain level of quality and, and, and consistency. Um, so that, 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 I, I, if anybody wants to add to that, that was my sort of initial answer. Well, oh, thank you very much, Simon. And it's, uh, oh. it's very rich. Uh, Abdullah, if you wanted to, to add something. Yeah, I just want to bring the, if you say the international uh, uh, context to the to the discussion. So, so here in the region, um, uh, we've we've seen number of I would say encouraging signs that sustainability is becoming more um, more serious, um, and I'll give uh, quickly a few signs of that. So developers, more developers are now committing to sustainability, either by the, having their own uh, sustainability strategies and plans, you know, 2040, 2050, 2060, whatever is the time frame, but but they are becoming more you know uh, interested and more serious about uh, sustainability in what they develop especially in the new projects uh, and this is across uh, many of the MENA uh, countries but more specifically I would say in Saudi Arabia and, and UAE and probably other countries. 
the second one is the um, hospitality sector. We've we've seen an a growth in in the um, number of hotels who are also uh, interested and keen to show or to prove uh, that they are you know performing uh, sustainably in in their operations, um, and that's especially in the UAE um, this this year. And uh, thirdly, uh, even schools and universities, um, and, and here I, I would just mention UAE because I'm sure of this, I'm not sure of about, about the other countries, but even schools and, U, and, and universities are expressing interest in, in, in you know, um, uh, in investigating or understanding how schools can become green uh, or how can schools become sustainable. And, and there is um, some kind of commitments from even governmental entities towards, you know, schools, uh, but also the hospitality sectors uh, to help uh, regulate or even to help you know those those uh, entities and organizations uh, join the journey towards sustainability and uh, uh, and and become you know sustainability become uh, part of their DNA or embedded in their you know uh, decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Abdulatif. It's very uh, it's very clear, and uh, I could add on to what you have said both. Uh, that in continental Europe, uh, there is also a, 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 a new regulation which is under discussion that where uh, life cycle carbon assessment will become mandatory for a project which will be bigger than 5,000 square meters. And in some countries, like you mentioned, Simon, in France, it's already mandatory since a year now. Uh, and we have to calculate embodied carbon and uh, energy uh, uh, carbon emissions. So yes, it's moving. What I could add also as a second topic that we, we will also dig, it, dig in further is that uh, the uh, international norms on uh, accountability and accountancy are working with ISSB and other organization to implement into the financial report extra financial data that are linked to carbon emissions. Uh, and it's normal because in a way, uh, all the countries who were and were at the COP28 uh, uh, in Dubai were in the national declaration, and it has to be backed up by information linked to uh, the different stakeholders, transportation, agriculture, and of course, real estate. So uh, we will certainly see also uh, more and more regulation about giving the information uh, to, to the market. And we have, as you said, Simon, a demand from users, tenants, uh, who ask to see when, which kind of building and how performing at all green it is. Louisa, you wanted to add something and maybe uh, we can also uh, go further in the discussion. Um, do you see uh, that there is sufficient progress to achieve uh, 2050 uh, 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 targets? Louisa. Thank you. No, I was just going to add a very brief point on to the end of um, that question with um, Simon and Abdullah. Um, it, it was more about the, our observations as a practice. So again, I'm a trained architect, similar to Simon, but and I work in a um, practice called Hawkins Brown, quite a big practice in the UK. Um, and um, but I run our specialist um, sustainability team and I've been one of the co-authors on the version two of the RIC standard as well. So one of the things that we've observed in our practice is a lot of conversation around sustainability targets and a lot of commitment at the early stages, but then, you know, as difficult decisions get made over the design process and cost, et cetera, comes in, there's some of these barriers. And I was interested in one of the figures that wasn't on the slides actually that Keisha presented, but was in the report which talks about barriers um, and, you know, why some of these things aren't delivered, you know, to the best practice that they know they could or should be. And some of those things were about sort of very, very real concerns about high initial costs. And is that cost then going to be um, delivered in, in terms of long term value? So if we were going to concentrate anywhere in 2024, that seems to me, you know, a really good place to start. Um, and so going then going on to your next question, um, which was about um, sort of, are we making sufficient progress to net zero by 2050? Um, I think Simon's right. There's definitely a shift in perception. There's a shift in awareness. There's a shift in some progress being made. And I think it's being made more in some areas than others. And that I suppose that's partly my observation. Um, 
the rise in demand for these um, sort of climate adaptions and green buildings is really encouraging because the greater demand in the market, the more certainty there'll be for investment, for upskilling, for the skills that we need. Um, again, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to talk slightly from the UK point of view, but I'll try and make it general. So I'm talking from London. Um, but one, one really encouraging thing for us was that the GLA updated one of their policies recently to ask for declaration of energy use intensity alongside um, building rigs compliance. And that's quite a big step actually for the UK because certain industry figures have been pushing for that for a long time. Because what it allows us to do is encourage much more thorough energy analysis at the design stage so that we can push reductions. And also it closes the performance gap because there's a lot more, um, you can actually compare those figures to the metered data. So we're really encouraging, we're really encouraged by this concentration on energy use reductions. Um, I think there's another piece going on in the UK at the moment where we have our future home standard, which promises to deliver sort of 75 to 80% carbon um, reductions, but it doesn't kick in really until 2025. So. The progress made on that side of things is potentially slower than it could or should be. Um, it's there's a lot of um, will in the UK to get this to work. There was a huge response to the consultation that went out, but we're still not entirely sure of the technical detail of some of that. So that's that's hopefully another thing to work on 2024. Um, I think your part of your question was about the natural environment. Obviously, this is sort of in indirectly linked I suppose to net zero in the sense that obviously the more protection we can afford to nature um, you know the, the more effect we can have on our carbon emission reductions um, and I think again in the UK we saw a disappointing pullback I think from the biodiversity net gain policies that were going to be put in um, they are still going ahead but um, a bit delayed so that's a shame because the industry had been gearing up to implementing some of that and, um, and now it's been delayed. Um, to make a bit of a segue into embodied carbon, there's a number of groups looking at the effects of ecological embodied carbon. So what, what you know, how, how are the decisions we're making on materials and embodied carbon affecting our natural environment? And that's quite an interesting subject that I think again will expand um, next year. And so then finally on embodied carbon, which is one of my really special passions, um, I think on this one progress is too slow. And Simon's right. I think the version two of the RICS standard is, um, you know, hopefully leads the way now to the consistency and the credibility of these measurements, which um, has, you know, could have been argued to have delayed some of the policy requirements that we want. Um, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, you know, the Environment Audit Committee issued a report a year or two ago saying really we should bring in regulation in the UK by December 2023. We're in December 2023 and it hasn't happened yet. Um, they're now saying around 2025. Um, and there was a project by the UK GBC, um, which was a net zero roadmap, which indicated certain policy drivers that are actually you have required to get us to net zero by 2050. And that mandatory whole life carbon assessment for, for, as, for major projects over a thousand square meters was one of their key policies and should really have happened in the early 2020s. Um, and so we're already, you know, not on some of these trajectories that have been sort of mapped out for us. So that for me is quite, you know, a really key thing to push. In the UK, we're campaigning for part Z. I know other European countries have regulation um, and really we need to be following suit um, and I think the other thing that I've noticed is that a number of local authorities are now following the pathway set out by the GLA so because building regulation hasn't stood up and responded the, the planning authorities are now responding themselves um, but at a local level and so this is good in some senses but some of the policies they have the potential if they're not national to not necessarily align with each other or take a slightly different local view um, and where there's slight tweaks or differences confusion can set in um, so there's a number of local authorities in the UK doing brilliant stuff but if it's not unified um, it, it could cause yeah a, a degree of confusion 
But I think the good news is that if, if we're all measuring to the RICS sort of version two standard, then that is you know, the, consistent, um, the consistent standard. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. I'll see if the other panelists have got it. Thank you very much, Lisa. But in the report also, we have <clears throat> questions about uh, circular economy and uh, what kind of sustainable practices uh, uh, and, and adoption of circular economy could be also, according to you, uh, uh, a, more, a better a better policy to reduce the the, the embodied carbon. Um, yeah, I think that's right. It does touch on the answer from from the last question. So I think carrying on from that, um, the mandatory whole life carbon and embodied carbon measurement across the board would, would just be a massive step. Um, there's the potential also to encourage, mandate, you know, a number of measurements through the design stage, for example. So it's not just a reporting mechanism, it's actually, it actually becomes a design tool. Because what we want to achieve is not just knowing what carbon we're emitting, we need to actually physically reduce it. And the only way that we're going to do that is by understanding the data. Um, so I think um, there was a consultation run about a month ago, the GLA put a call out to industry on their London plan. They're looking to rewrite to, you know, to start thinking about if they um, do the do updates. But of course they're, you know, three to five years away. But you know, the attendees to that overwhelmingly asked for more coverage, you know, cover more buildings, not just the referable ones, the major projects as well. Um, and also to link more heavily, you've mentioned circular economy, to link the circular economy policies that um, are emerging with whole life carbon. So that firstly, so there's no duplication of reporting because a lot of the metrics are relatively similar, but secondly, to the, so the two can reinforce each other. So we've seen, a, I mean, Simon mentioned retrofit, for example, which in some sectors is having, um, you know, a, quite a good resurgence, let's say, in terms of that interest um but in some sectors not so can we drive retrofit more through un a better understanding of the circular economy a more robust policy around you know interrogate the building first before you recommend demolition and then tying that into our whole life carbon and our net zero ambitions so hopefully we'll see a lot more joining up of those um, principles and see them less as separate disciplines and actually completely um, sort of interlinked I think the other thing we're seeing on circular economy is um, quite a lot of concentration on, you know, some, some of the more future looking mechanisms, let's say, so design for assembly, um, long life, long life loose fit principles. They're, they're great, but the value of that will only be realized in sort of 60 to 100 years, you know, when the buildings are deconstructed or, or reused. Um, and so much more concentration on retrofit and reducing upfront carbon now will definitely help um, in terms of that um, net zero target um, that, that we need to meet. Um, I think the other thing that I've seen is the UK GBC held a consultation this um, December, I think it closed in December, on um, how we should um, how we should approach embodied carbon in our scope three um, reporting, you know, as businesses. So, you know, different stakeholders um, follow the greenhouse gas protocol and report their emissions. So how should we deal with embodied carbon in that? And if some of the recommendations from that piece of work go forwards, and they are collaborating with the SBTI on this as well, that could have a real sea change again in creating this market and um, more consistency for measurement. Um, if that's if embodied carbon is required as mandatory reporting under the greenhouse gas protocol, that could definitely drive a sea change. Um, and the more data there is, the more it's disclosed, you know, the more we can share benchmark um, drive good practice. So all of that's great. I think the final point on data disclosure is, is to say that the RICS version 2 team and the um, BECD team have been working quite closely together as well. Um, and the, um, the, the more data we can get onto that, um, Sort of project database, the better really, um, and the more consistency um, we'll drive through that. All right, thank you very much, Kisha. So maybe we can imagine that uh, in a in a in a in a future, that when we have an existing building, 
uh, the carbon embedded in the existing building could be an added value. And we all know that it costs more money to uh, retrofit than to destroy and rebuild. So maybe the difference linked into the value of a non-emitted carbon by the existing building could be a way to uh, also launch, uh, to, to help, to uh, have a financial balance in the project that could be, uh, that could be better. So Simon, you wanted to add something, please. Yeah. There we go. That's better. Um, just something I also wanted to, to, to add, which I think is quite important. In the RICS second edition, one of the things that's been done, and this was done by uh, the two authors, Clara Bagnell George and Louise Amo, who um, have worked out how to translate energy, i.e., kilowatt hours, into carbon emissions, i.e., kilograms CO2e per meter squared. So, what that has enabled, of course, is you can now of course, understand all these things using the same currency, if you like, and therefore you can look at carbon cost benefits. So, for example, insulation will have a carbon cost, but it'll also have a benefit, um, a carbon benefit in terms of reducing emissions in one area. But obviously, where you have a carbon cost benefit equation, the idea is to make it work in your favour rather than against you. And I think that's quite an important point because although embodied carbon and operational carbon have different ways of dealing with them. Actually, you have to look at them as a whole. Thank you. I couldn't agree more, Simon. Well, uh, we have a question about how sustainability issue can affect the value of properties. And uh, uh, I, I read the report, so I, the, the, my first answer is uh, have a look on uh, page uh, seven of the report, Kishna, because uh, there is clearly a, a, a graph showing that uh, uh, the impact, uh, according to the people who answered, is on rents and prices of uh, value. We also have a lot of scientific survey that were conducted by different researchers and that RICS also has participated in that show off that there is maybe what the evidence we have is that we have clearly an impact on non-green building by brown discount. Green value is something that is uh, a discussion still, but Kisha, what could you say about that, about the results you have about these uh, sustainability features and capital value, and what do you see still, uh, the, let's say, uh, the main buyers that remains? So for the for the green premium slash brown discount, we actually explored this this idea in the in the 2022 report where we specifically asked professionals, um, do you see a, a brown discount or green premium link to uh, sustainable buildings? And majority of them said yes. And again, it was consistent with other research studies by JLL, by by Nai Frank, who I think one of them was looking into the the presence of a green premium also linked to London offices in central London and found that the green premium was also present. So we've explored this idea um, last year. We've also explored it this year in the 2023 report where majority of contributors said that yes, that uh, sustainability features do have a significant impact on the value and on on the sort of the capital values of the properties. Uh, moving on to the, the main barriers to greater sustainable practices in real estate, there are a lot. Um, whilst we've sort of we've heard from Simon and Louisa and as well as Abdul Latif that there's been significant progress in certain areas, um, the truth of the matter is that sustainability and green issues have been sort of ignored in the built environment for a very long time. So for a number of years we haven't prioritised sustainability, we haven't prioritised green buildings. Um, the industry is not used to, for example, measuring carbon, it's not used to prioritising renovation and retrofitting over demolition, it's not used to collecting key data on uh, construction projects, it's not used to sort of looking into recycling and reuse of materials. So there needs to be a change of behaviour um, and change of importance um, on, on sustainability uh, uh, across the built environment. But that change comes at a cost. It costs a lot of time and money and investment to be able to incite that change within the sector as a whole. And what we've noticed from the conversations that we've had and from the feedback from our surveys is that not many people are willing to pay for that cost. 
uh, so for, for example, when if uh, a uh, an investor is investing in the green building and buys, uh, buys at a premium, um, they are more likely to pass on that cost to its occupiers in the form of higher rents. So no one's really willing to pay, pay for that higher cost of being sustainable, being green. Um, so, and there is also an argument that perhaps the industry is not willing to change. Uh, perhaps uh, firms in organisations are able to make bold statements, uh, are interested in sort of the brand uh, value associated with sustainability with, with green, but perhaps they're not very, there's not much very meaningful action. So the action doesn't actually match the ambition that these firms are actually setting out to do. Um, so, and that needs to change specifically. Uh, we've, we actually asked uh, a question relating to the key barriers um, that is pre that are preventing the sector from addressing its carbon emissions in the 2022 report. Um, there was a number of barriers that we listed. I think there was about 15 of them. And the barrier that was probably at the top of the list uh, was the lack of established standards, guidance and tools. So it, it seemed that the uh, professionals were telling us that perhaps the industry needs more support. Now, we've, we've got the whole lack of carbon standard for second edition, so perhaps some of these barriers may be broken. But again, adoption of standards and tools and the, the BECD has also been mentioned using that, uh, collecting key data and using that and recording it um, will be keen into sort of uh, um, breaking those key barriers. Um, skills and knowledge uh, of, of professionals is another key barrier. Again, because sustainability has not been part of the process for such a long time, uh, our professionals are not skilled, they're not trained into addressing sustainability issues, and that needs to change specifically. Um, so developing skills around these issues, around sustainability, um, needs to be a priority, and it, it, and it must be applied to every professional that's involved in the construction value chain. Um, and finally, one key point is that the construction value chain is highly complex. There are a number of st stakeholders, each with their own objectives. So what you could have is that the date, that the key data might get lost in the process. Um, so for example, uh, the development of digital tools, uh, building information modeling uh, can help record key data on, uh, on key projects linked to sustainability. And perhaps that data can be shared across stakeholders. And then it will be. Then the industry would be in a pe better position to sort of address, you know, where carbon savings can be made, and what challenges are present, and how they can be addressed. Thank you, Kisha. So, well, if I try to say it in other words, we see also clearly that a green building and its answer to the uh, question we had, uh, a sustainable or a green building is uh, more liquid because. Uh, if there is more demand on such building on the market, and also uh, it's more resilience because you, 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 if you have such a green building, then the obsolescence is is slower. So uh, we also have these two impact that can have an impact on the risk and the liquidity, which is the two 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 part of the uh, of the value uh, linked to 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 an asset. Uh, I'm going back to you, Simon, because. Well, as Kisha said, there is a lot of complexity in supply chains. Uh, how can we work on building the trust thanks to uh, standards in order to ensure that from the design to completion to uh, building in use, uh, we can have uh, a, a right level of trust thanks to the transparency of data built on the standard? Um, yeah, thank you, Frank. I, I think there's a number of issues here. I think probably the most important one is education, if you like. Um, firstly, I think people need to understand um, the uh, ways of undertaking this. So we've talked about the RICS uh, second edition of the uh, uh, hollow carbon standard. So I think when people realize that there are ways of assessing this that are straightforward and, 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 and accessible, um, that's an important point because that will start to feed down through the whole process. I think the other thing that's really important is that, uh, as part of education, if you like, is the recognition that actually, um, unlike so 
typically sustainability has this image across the construction industry of being an on cost that it's an extra cost and i can understand why that is perceived because for a lot of things like certainly in, in colder climates you know if you put it in extra insulation or double glazing let's say that adds a cost clearly over single glazing less insulation however i think with with carbon assessment whole life carbon it's about efficient use of resources and ultimately that will mean reducing costs rather than increasing costs and i think people therefore should not be frightened of the idea of undertaking whole life carbon assessment i think that feeds into if you like the business case for uh, undertaking whole life carbon assessments so for example um, it feeds directly into things like value engineering where you're trying to uh, make buildings more efficient not just on a, a construction basis but also on a long-term basis so you're making buildings more durable and, 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 and resilient which feeds into long-term long-term asset value so I think there's there's a kind of education uh, and business case and there's also the um, and then moving on from that I think there's things like legislative pressure well clearly we need uh, legislation. Um, unfortunately, I think, well, certainly in the UK, legislation is drifting along, as Louisa has already mentioned, but um, although there's been recommended stuff, it, it's just taking time. And that means we need greater political pressure. Uh, and of course, that is not really strong enough. And you only have to look at what's going on at COP28 to see that they're having real difficulty in actually achieving, um, you know, a, 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 a kind of global agreement vis-a-vis -vis, for example fossil fuels so there is we need greater political pressure which will lead to um, legislative pressure but i think the thing that seems to be telling most at the moment is is commercial pressure um, and commercial pressure is coming and i mentioned a couple of companies at the beginning of my uh, the first answer i gave but the the, the commercial pressure um, which is driven by to some extent by tenants but also by uh, as i say long-term asset value that kind of thing I think that will is ultimately what's pushing this market ahead, and I think will feed back into supply chains. Um, and I think, um, you know, for example, I think one of the things that will come out of this is that all glass facades, or all aluminium and glass facades, will be a thing of the past because they're in they're not possible to defend them in either operational or embodied terms or combination of the two. So. You know, we will see a change in architecture, but I think that's quite exciting. I think we will see the web buildings changing. I think what's already happening and talk to in terms of things like technology is that, um, and I don't think technology can be expected to answer everything. I think it's about being, it's about innovation. And I think there is increasing innovation in, in, in products. Quite often it's a smaller scale, sort of domestic scale, but already there are ways of, um, for example, um, there's a company in the Netherlands, which is, able to extract unused cement out of concrete and i didn't even know there was unused cement in concrete but apparently there is and they can extract it at a commercially agreeable sort of level and resell it so those kind of things are making a difference so i think there's a range of of, of possibilities um coming through uh, but i think the main one is for people to realize that actually there's a positive business reason for undertaking carbon assessments thank you Thank you very much, Simon. Well, and as you said, and uh, uh, we see it in the in the result on page four of the report that uh, in different countries there is uh, an adoption or 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 not or less uh, of the uh, sustainable building and and what I could say in continental Europe, clearly we are pushed by the regulation with a lot of uh, uh, laws that are implemented by the uh, European Union to push the investors to focus on, uh, on green buildings. And I think it's one of the reason, uh, again, also with a pull from the, from the users and long-term investors, uh, we see it clearly. But we see also in this result, uh, Abdul Latif, that uh, Middle East is also uh, really uh, uh, on, on, on the top uh, about uh, the way uh, uh, the, 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 the market is uh, adopting. Uh, this uh, green building model uh, uh, in green building certifications and uh, and sustainability. Uh, can you tell us in Middle East what kind of opportunities, challenges uh, are there, and or could you explain that you have more interest in Middle East than uh, in America or Asia Pacific? If I look at the diagram on the on the report, Abdulatif. Um. So okay, let me start with with few few opportunities here uh, in the region. Um, 
there are so many new developments to, to come, if you say, uh, um, uh, in different countries in the region, uh, whether it's uh, because of the demand for, for new buildings or new developments in new communities uh, for countries like in, in the GCC, or it's to rebuild, you know, what has been destroyed, uh, and uh, you know, either because of wars or because of, you know, uh, um, let's say natural disasters like in countries in Iraq, you know, Syria, Palestine, Morocco, etc. So, so that means to build new buildings and and make new cities or communities, you know, taking into consideration, you know, sustainability practices and best practices. So then those buildings become really green or become very efficient mm -hmm. uh, and then you can apply all these new technologies whether using you know digitalization or even using you know new models like circularity and and so on so this is this is this is number one number two um the one one of the advantages in this region is that you have a high percentage of the population being young so they have this new mindset but they also have the passion and interest in protecting the planet if if i would say uh, and and those young people, whether they are currently in the universities or you know fresh graduates, they will be the the ones who will lead really the future. Uh, and I believe with with the right kind of education and awareness, um, they will certainly do a lot, you know, to to improve the built environment here. So this is an opportunity, another opportunity. Um, but also, you know, the opportunity where we have. Uh, a lot of uh, resources when it comes to energy and, and natural resources and many of them are renewable resources or clean resources if i would say so this is also opportunity to help in decarbonizing the built uh, sector now l let me touch upon the challenges that we face um, certainly one of the key challenges is regulations uh, the current regulations are not are not to the level where it really um, I would say encourage uh, or, or or even enforce, you know, uh, green uh, practices in the built environment. However, uh, I think this will change very soon because they the regulators are seeing that, you know, the private sector, the developers, the consultants are are even you know doing much more ahead of what the regulations. However, we still need regulations, so this will change. But this is a challenge by itself. Uh, the other thing is the skills. Now, on one hand. This region attracted and is still attracting, you know, um, expats from all over the world. So with 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 you know skills with expertise. Uh, however, we need to build the local skills and the local expertise. And and this in some countries is is a challenge by itself. But I think there is some work in in progress. Um, the um, uh, the other challenges is currently availability of green materials or you know sustainable materials. We we talk, you talked a lot about embedded carbon. I think this is something very new in in, in this region. Uh, however, I can say that interest is growing here, and you know we had so many discussions uh, with with different stakeholders about you know green materials and embedded carbon in construction materials. Um, so I, I think I think we've we've done number of studies that that you know uh, highlights and and uh, uh, let's say deep dive into the more challenges and and opportunities. Um, but I, I think I've, I've mentioned what I, I believe is, is good to mention for this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, very, very clear and uh, interesting. Well, we, we are closing to the end, so I would ask uh, each of our panelists, uh, well, how, how do you see that the uh, coordination between uh, professional bodies and, and policymakers and stakeholders can increase uh, uh, the uh, implementation of uh, sustainability into built environment. So, how, how do you see and how do you imagine that uh, could be the uh, focus, let's say, of next year 2024 report? Uh, Louisa first, maybe? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I mean, I think one of the things we've identified with some of the um, delays that have occurred in, in the regulations, you know, industry here has been pushing for is that you know if there was a policy framework set out for all this num number of improvements that we need to make and it's phased and it's timetabled and it's not railed back on then it provides certainty to the stakeholders in the supply chain to put the right investment into developing an innovative product as simon said or upskilling or creating training courses i mean in the uk still we don't you know we any professional can create a whole life carbon assessment and, and say that it's compliant with the sort of RIC standard. So 
you know, there, we may see actually some training and some certification coming into that type of discipline, for example, which might again help the credibility. So I think that definitely policy and um, uh, sort of the profession, let's say, collaborating on this, super important. I think my final point um, is that, well, again, from conversations with planners, at least in the UK, um, they are getting better at requesting evidence, for example, for design initiatives or, you know, have you done your energy assessment, have you done your overheating assessment, etc. Um, but what, they, what, what the next step that's required is to actually ascertain performance levels as a result of those pieces of analysis, for example. And hopefully we'll start to see the same with whole life carbon and embodied carbon as well. So we're not just doing the evidence and the measuring, we're actually doing something about it through the design. Thank you, Louisa. Simon? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd very much agree with Louisa. I think that um, it needs to be both carrot and stick <laughs> and example. I think in the UK, the government you know, claims that we're doing wonderful things, but in fact, it's not true. Um, and I think we need to um, not only uh, legislate, which we clearly do need to do, but we also need to incentivize. And I think the government, for, on all their projects, although they say they're going to do this, they, they, what they need to do is actually undertake whole life carbon assessments on every government-based project. Uh, and that in itself would make a big difference. Um, so I think, but you know, we, we, we're, we're, we're getting, I mean, uh, Louisa and I are both talking to one of the government departments in the UK, and you know, we get a whole lot of strange questions. In fact, a lot of those are kind of classic delaying tactic questions, if you like. So we need to, you know, we need to have a positive mindset, recognize that this has to happen quickly, uh, and we need to get a move on um, because we haven't got the time to mess around. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, great, Simon. And uh, yeah, I, I also do believe, as you said, that uh, building the trust between stakeholders about the data, transparency, and the standards, so it's built will be a key uh, a key answer also for investors to trust in in, in the uh, embodied carbon the real carbon images and so on because there is really i think a key word is building the trust and do if in in your in your region what do you see what could be uh, um uh, I, I will say maybe two, two words uh because of time so uh, and i will focus on professional bodies really is capacity building uh, and then awareness. Uh, and when I say awareness, I'm talking about awareness across you know, the public, but capacity building across the professionals, you know, architects, engineers, uh, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. So Kisha, maybe you, you already have uh, some, uh, some path for the, uh, or some targets for the next report next year. Uh, uh, so uh, a conclusion word? Um, yes, I mean, for professional bodies, uh, very much agree with Abdul Latif, uh, but also developing and enhancing industry standards. So we've, we're already in a great footing with the ICMS3 and whole life carbon assessment, but we need to continuously work on research and develop the standards further uh, um, as, as we address further climate challenges. Um, enhancing skills and knowledge will always, always be a, a priority because there's no point in developing standards that nobody can use. So enhancing skills and knowledge of professionals in the industry will be key. Uh, for policymakers, I pretty much agree with you, and Simon. Um, regularly impulses, tax advantages, subsidies that in incentivize change will be important. Um, Public-private partnerships, collaborations uh, are key to identifying key challenges um, and sort of pinpointing uh, challenges in developing, sort of, for example, scalable projects. Um, so, uh, one key aspect should be mandating embodied carbon assessment across all construction projects. That should be a priority for all for, for, for all countries, as well as setting minimum energy performance standards. Um, just to give some clarity to for occupiers and investors that this is the future and this is what they should be investing in. Very ambitious and clear targets, Kisha. That's clear. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> So uh, we are we are no uh, out of time. So uh, I think we could do a, a much more longer uh, webinar and uh, and keep going on the discussion because it's uh, really a very very uh, uh, passionating uh, discussion. So uh, as we are closing, so I want really to thank uh, the panelists. Thank you very much, 
time and ability, Luisa Kisha. Thank you very much for your, uh, your 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 vision and the different outputs you gave to to this panel. Uh, I want to thank also uh, the uh, participants that are around 50 countries, more or less. So uh, thank you very much to all the participants and the questions they they put in the chat uh, to uh, this discussion.